And uh, go ahead, Jeff. Thank you. Well, thank you, Doug, and good morning. As uh, Doug mentioned, I'm Jeff Andreessen uh, with Michigan State University in East Lansing, and I'll start the discussion this morning here uh, talking a little bit about uh, weather and climate. And I'm going to focus primarily, we, our last meeting here goes back to the early part of the summer in late June. And so much of what I'll talk about here, at least initially, we'll be focusing on the time since then, including portions of the summer, the latter part of the summer, and then into the fall. Uh, I'm gonna start with mean temperatures here though, uh, as an overview and start by saying that the three month August through October period our average temperatures ended up uh, warmer than normal across eastern portions of the Great Lakes Basin and cooler than normal across central and western sections. And you can see that here uh, in the center of the largest uh, image here. But uh, it's important to note there, there are temporal trends here that were at play as well. And uh, over on the left, I've got the uh, temperature departure from normal for the same area for the, the continental US here. Uh, for the month of August on the top, and then uh, for the month of October on the bottom. And what you can clearly see, uh, and we could actually throw July in here as well, uh, since it's one of the months that we're looking at, but over most all of the basin, we had uh, warmer than normal. And actually some cases, especially during July, significantly warmer than normal mean temperatures for the summer. Uh, and then by the time we got into September, our, our temperatures cooled off and actually went below normal. And then during the month of October here, most recently, as you can see in the lower left, large areas except for the far eastern portion of the basin, and once again, uh, were significantly cooler than normal. That's especially true as you go to the upper lakes uh, and in the western portions of the basin were, were significantly cooler than normal. So a major change from above normal in some spots or some portions of the basin to cooler than normal with time, especially uh, into the fall. One other, I think, point that's important to make is because of that, and also because of uh, less clouds than normal across portions of the basin, our evaporation rates during the summer were elevated. We could see that uh, we look at potential evapotranspiration for agriculture, for example, and those rates during the middle uh, and into the latter part of the summer were also elevated. So the above normal temperatures likely did lead to enhanced evaporation during that time of the year, but now we've gone again reverse in terms of temperature. Precipitation, uh, it all depends on where you were. We, we've got a, a large variability across the uh, region. Our three month totals range from less than six inches across uh, portions of Indiana, Illinois, uh, and uh, even northern Wisconsin, and then far eastern portions of the basin, western New York, uh, northern Pennsylvania, to more than 15 inches of, uh, of precip, especially across uh, central and northern portions of the basin, the upper peninsula of Michigan, northern lower Michigan, and then central Wisconsin. Uh, it's a little a little deceptive here, the, uh, the, the color ramp in this particular graphic, looking at uh, the observed totals here on the left. Uh, usually we see the green indicate the large amounts and the brown vice versa. This one is actually reversed, so it's a little bit uh, counter to what we typically see. Again, the, the browns uh, and into the reds are the highest totals there. In terms of percentages of normal, though, a wide variety because of that large range in, uh, in precipitation, ranging from uh, about 70 to 80 percent of normal across the lower lakes, especially western New York, northwestern Pennsylvania, uh, and then northern Indiana, southern Michigan, northwest, extreme northwest Ohio, and then portions of the western basin up in northern Wisconsin, up into the arrowhead of Minnesota. Uh, also note, though, you don't have to go very far. Uh, again, portions of western upper Michigan, northern lower Michigan, and then southern Wisconsin, we've got the opposite, uh, in some cases more uh, than 125% of normal. So it really depended on where you were. It's important to note that over portions of the Midwest this year, we did have significant drought conditions develop, especially as you move west and south uh, into the Corn Belt from the Great Lakes region. There was also significant and prolonged dryness across portions of the mid-Atlantic. Uh, again, in the, some of what you see here uh, in the right-hand side reflects that. One last thing on the upper right-hand corner, uh, we have some data uh, taken from uh, the NOAA's Climate Prediction Center with uh, international data, and it indicates that this drier than normal area here did extend up into portions of Southern Ontario 
so some northeastern portions of the basin were also drier than normal. Uh, one last thing about this in terms of the climatology, uh, it, it really again depended on where you were, but our, our annual total so far through 10 months of the year through the end of October uh, range from below normal in some of the same areas that you're seeing here reflected as drier than normal to above normal uh, for the year. So in terms of the climatology, I think it's probably safe to say with just two months to go here for the end that some areas of the, some portions of the basin, especially in the north and central portions uh, will be above wetter than normal, while other uh, portions, uh, especially the eastern part of the basin, and then uh, again, the area from Chicago through northern Indiana into southern Michigan will probably uh, fall below the long-term normal. So a little bit of a cancellation, but not nearly as wet as what we saw uh, during the 2019 calendar year, which, which for many areas of the region was a, a new all-time record for the wettest, uh, wettest, certainly of the last more than one century. And as a result of this, in terms of soil moisture, uh, looking here at the left, this is as of, or this is for the entire month of October as an average, but it closely reflects the precipitation patterns and anomalies that you just saw here uh, with below normal soil moisture here, uh, again, across the lower lakes, and then portions of, uh, again, Indiana, Michigan, uh, and then far as you go farther west, I mentioned the drought conditions in western Iowa, up into portions of, uh, out in the Great Plains, uh, contrasted with above normal, uh, soil moisture here in the north where we had the above normal uh, precipitation during the late summer. So no real, real surprises there. Uh, down below though, I think it is important, this is also looking at the uh, change in soil moisture that occurred from the latter part of the summer into the end of, uh, of October here. But you can see for most of the basin, we did see a decrease, which, which is typical for the season. Uh, we typically see our lowest soil moisture levels, at least in the top, a few feet of the profile occur during the uh, the, the early fall. That's that's uh, typically how the system works. But certainly there were decreases over most of the uh, most of the area. One exception here, notable exception, northern Ohio and portions of the Lake Erie uh, drainage basin. You can see there were actually some increases. And our stream flow uh, again with the data here from USGS on the right hand side here uh, fairly closely reflects these some of these same patterns you you see here. Most of the uh, surface water in, in the region is indicated between the 25th and the 75th percentile, but there are some exceptions to that that reflect those anomalies that you've just seen. And uh, in terms of uh, the U.S. drought monitor here, just looking at an overview, uh, portions of uh, the Great Lakes Basin here, especially in Indiana, portions of Michigan and uh, here do reflect those drier than normal conditions, as is the case over uh, western New York and western Pennsylvania down uh, close to the lower lakes. These uh, drought areas have been here for, well, have developed over the last few months, but uh, continue to the present time, uh, reflecting again, uh, longer term dryness in, uh, in those portions of the region. A couple of, of, of events, I guess, that are worth mentioning, and uh, we talk about weather and climate, but one that we really have to uh, to talk about a little bit here it was, uh, of, well, a unique event doesn't really do it justice, but uh, on the 10th of August uh, here, a couple months ago, we had a line of severe thunderstorms develop across, and you can see the, the time-lapse uh, image here, early morning, uh, about 8 o'clock local time on the 10th, southeastern South Dakota, northeastern Nebraska, and then move uh, rapidly to the east here. These are one-hour uh, shots here from the radar, uh, and well, because of a number of, of, of factors here, very, very strong uh, upper upper air dynamics or a number of, of, of issues at play here, but led to a, a an unusually prolonged event of severe thunderstorms. Large, large areas of the Midwest and the Corn Belt were impacted here with uh, severe and damaging winds, uh, which range from 70 to, uh, well, at least damage estimates suggest in a 140 mile per hour winds uh, with, with the storms. And it's a very, very, well, it is very, very unusual to see severe thunderstorms last in a pattern this long, but this so-called derecho event, or the line of severe thunderstorms impacted large areas of the Midwest, including portions of the Southwest uh, Basin, the Great Lakes Basin here, the Chicago metro area, and then you can see it moved on over through portions of lower Michigan finally before it dissipated. The uh, 
span of this, at least in terms of distance, was almost 800 miles in 14 hours. In some cases, though, the individual thunderstorms moved as rapidly as 65 to 75 or 70 miles per hour. One of the unusual or very, very uh, unique aspects of this particular event was that the damaging winds uh, in excess of 70 miles per hour uh, in portions of Iowa and Illinois lasted more than 30 minutes. That's that's something very, very odd. It's like a little bit like having a, a hurricane and actually a major hurricane at that uh, in this part of the world that we, we don't see those types of events, but uh, the result was widespread and severe property damage uh, across large portions of the region. Uh, as the uh, storms, the line moved here to propagate it to the east, they're actually, uh, because of the pressure differential and the winds out ahead of the event, it led to a medium tsunami event uh, across lake shore, uh, lake shore sections in southwestern lower Michigan uh, with as much as a one and a half uh, foot rise in lake levels. And of course, that's on top of already very, very high lake levels to begin with. So one of the last things that was needed or that was needed in this case. Uh, and then finally, uh, one of the reasons that, uh, that I had this here, it's just, we, it, it's, it's just an incredible thing. But the uh, damage estimate so far from NOAA's uh, National Centers for Environmental Information is seven and a half billion dollars as of, as of mid-October. They're still uh, being tabulated, some of the law here, but this would rank this event as uh, certainly the most costly uh, weather disaster related to severe thunderstorms in U.S. history, and probably more than that. It's uh, it just it it's uh, beyond anything that really is on the record books. But a very very costly event that uh, fortunately didn't didn't last any longer than it did, but it did impact southwestern portions of our our region here. One other uh, there's there's a lot. A lot of media uh, materials on this, but in the lower left, you can see a, uh, here a, a summary of some of the storm reports. Most of them were severe high wind uh, events associated with that. Uh, a couple of hail reports uh, and also a, uh, a, an outbreak of, they were relatively weak, but still uh, uh, tornado spin ups here, especially across northeastern Illinois, including the Chicago area and uh, portions of southern Wisconsin in northern uh, Indiana, but a large area of the Midwest, again, was impacted by this. On the lower right-hand side here, you can see some of the wind uh, damage over area here. And again, it's just uh, over much, much larger areas than we typically see with, uh, with severe weather during the summer. Uh, in the upper right, uh, courtesy of uh, NOAA's glaral observation point at South Haven, you can see as the line of thunderstorms or an image as it approached the uh, Southwest shore of, uh, of lower Michigan. So uh, an incredible event. And unfortunately, because it was moving so rapidly, the uh, precipitation totals with this were actually somewhat limited. Again, just given the the, uh, the rapid speed of this, but the high winds were, were something uh, very, very unique uh, and, and record setting. One last thing too, uh, it would, would be remiss with not mentioning that uh, during the latter half of October, we had an early onset of winter conditions across much of the north central part of the U.S., but it included western portions of uh, certainly the Great Lakes Basin. On the left-hand side here, you can see seasonal snowfall totals thus far, uh, or at least estimates here across uh, and, and much, much above normal snowfall. Uh, in, active storm track went through this area with uh, a lot of cold air in place, and you can see many areas. The yellow here is more than one foot. We've even got now two feet of a seasonal snowfall already in the Upper Peninsula uh, of Michigan, but portions of the basin have seen already uh, a, lot of, a lot of winter weather. Uh, we've looked at this in the past, and if you're wondering, is there any correlation with what happens afterwards? And uh, we can't, we haven't been able to find any. It's, it's fairly independent. So when we do have these early onsets of winter, uh, typically, uh, well, there's been a whole variety of weather that follows those uh, for the, the bulk of the winter, but this is certainly early for all these areas, and in some cases, the snowfall totals were record setting for, uh, for the dates, but a very, very snowy start of the season, at least for the western part of the basin. Moving ahead here, we'll transition into where we're headed. And as uh, most of you probably know and appreciate, we have had a visit from some uh, cold uh, Canadian origin air here over the last couple of days, but uh, there are major changes almost underway as we speak. Here, looking at the medium range forecast guidance, which will lead to almost the uh, extreme opposite. And this is the uh, six to 10 day outlook for the 7th through the 11th. The eight to 14 day is uh, is quite similar to this. 
but what it does suggest in terms of our jet stream flow across North America is almost a complete reversal with uh, a troughing out over the western portion of North America, a strong ridging, a highly amplified flow over North America, and then southwest flow across the Great Lakes leading to a, a rapid increase in temperatures from recent below normal levels to much above normal here by the end of the week and then probably continuing on into the following week as well. So major, major changes are, are underway. Also with the southwestern flow, we should have a fairly active storm track through the middle of the country. As you can see here, that's reflected with increased odds of uh, above normal precipitation. Lots of similarities between both, uh, again, the six to 10 day and the eight to 14 day outlook. So uh, big changes from where we have been here, at least uh, recently. Beyond that, uh, all eyes are looking at the equatorial Pacific uh, for uh, our La Nina conditions. And that's what I'm gonna talk about, at least start here with next, because it, it's a major part of our, uh, our outlook here as we look ahead. Uh, yeah, in the upper right hand corner here, you can see with the, uh, these are sea surface temperatures anomaly, uh, a sea surface temperatures anomalies, uh, excuse me. And the blue area here along the uh, central and eastern portion of the Pacific Basin here is what the hallmark signature, uh, cooler than normal water here of uh, La Nina event that has developed over the last few months. And actually now is at at least moderate uh, intensity. We've seen an increase in the strength of the trade winds and the, the, that part of the world, a decrease in convection as you move further west. So a lot, of, uh, a lot of major changes already in place in that part of the world. And I'll talk about why that's important for us here in just a second. But as we look at uh, temperature departures from normal, which is how we, we quantify or we, what we use as a matrix uh, for ENSO for both La Nina and El Nino, we can see currently that uh, our sea surface temperatures in that central and eastern portion of the Pacific are about a degree Celsius below normal. Anything uh, more than a half a degree Celsius is considered to be either a cool event, a La Nina event, or vice versa. If it were warm, uh, an El Nino. And the outlook here for the next several months is, is what all this uh, spaghetti plot shows. The dark, where the blue line here is a consolidated forecast. And so collectively what these uh, outlooks suggest is a strengthening of the La Nina currently into the middle of the winter, followed by a slow weakening then uh, into the spring of next year, and then finally back to neutral by the time we get probably to the late spring or certainly the early summer. So uh, this is, a, and this is a classic timing of a, uh, well, both El Nino and a La Nina event, similar type of, uh, again, of, of a lifetime uh, and, and uh, in terms of the seasonality as well. But right now, very, very safe to say uh, strong probabilities of La Nina continuing, and that will have major influence on our, our outlook. It is the most uh, frequently used way uh, or tool in, uh, in looking at long lead outlooks here for this time of the year. And the reason is why, why does it influence us uh, here in the mid latitude so many, so far away from the equatorial Pacific? And that is that we, we typically see an interaction with the jet stream, which, which of course does influence our weather here in this, uh, on a day-to-day -day and a week-to-week -week basis. And typically what happens during La Nina especially during the middle and latter part of the, the boreal in the Northern Hemisphere winter, is we see a more amplified jet stream pattern across North America. That's illustrated here. And that leads to uh, uh, colder than normal temperatures across portions of the North Central US, including the Western part of the Great Lakes Basin. Uh, but perhaps even uh, more importantly, it also leads to an active storm track through the Ohio Valley. And you can see here, uh, wetter than normal conditions are a, a very usual uh, not always, but uh, a common uh, anomaly we see climatologically, again, during the latter half of the winter, and you'll see that that comes up here. The other uh, portion I should mention here, other important thing to note, uh, the southern part of the U.S. typically is uh, much warmer and drier than normal during La Nina winters, and that's, again, also a part of the outlooks as we move ahead. So I'll start here with the long lead outlooks from, again, NOAA's uh, Climate Prediction Center. Uh, with the one month for November on the top here. And this is just uh, actually was revised here on Saturday. Uh, the mean temperature forecast is on the upper right here. Uh, precipitation forecast on the, in the upper uh, right. But you can see uh, expectations are for, well, certainly favor milder than normal temperatures during the month uh, of November uh, with no real direction, forecast direction here in terms of precipitation. For the three month, November through January timeframe, 
again, favor a little bit of a favor or edge towards uh, normal or above normal temperatures uh, and, and no direction on precip. You can also, though, begin to see a little bit of the signature of uh, a La Nina start to show up in this. And when I go here next, now to the subsequent outlook, starting with December, January, and February here in the upper left, and then moving through the winter, you can clearly see, again, uh, just a classic uh, La Nina type of forecast with cooler than normal temperatures favored across much of the northern U.S., up to uh, really into the western portions of the Great Lakes Basin, uh, and then just as important, importantly, uh, enhanced likelihood of above normal precipitation, especially moving into the second half of, uh, of the winter. So uh, that's that's usually what we see with La Nina. And I, I would also mention, again, given continued strengthening, uh, while the, the magnitude of the La Nina event does not indicate how strong these uh, climatic anomalies may be, it does increase the probability that we will see them. Uh, at least that's that's the way it has been in the past. So the stronger this event gets, uh, the more confidence we have in the, in this outlook as uh, is really is, is portrayed here. Uh, one last thing here too, with uh, well normal or even maybe a little bit cooler than normal temperatures and above normal precipitation, it's not a big surprise to see a, a, a forecast or at least a forecast direction uh, for above normal snowfall totals. And that's uh, more often than not what we do see during uh, La Nina winters. And you can see that here in the blue for much of the northern U.S., uh, from the Pacific Northwest eastward into the northern Great Plains and then into the Great Lakes Basin, uh, above normal snowfall totals uh, are, are the, at least the, the direction that we've seen with past La Ninas. And with that, I think I'm going to, to wrap up here and I'll, I'll hand it off to our next speaker. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. And just a, a couple of things I should have mentioned at the beginning. Um, One is we are recording this, and so we'll we'll send out a a message at some point telling you where that's going to be and and how to get it and all that business. And then uh, secondly, um, my name is Doug Cluck. I do work for NOAA, the National Centers for Environmental Information. So just wanted to get that out of the way since I never introduced myself. Okay, so John Alice is up next from the Corps of Engineers. He is going to continue our uh, conversation on lake levels. So go ahead, John. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Doug. Um, yeah, so I'm John Ellis. I'm with the Army Corps of Engineers out of Detroit. Uh, my office handles uh, monitoring the water levels of the Great Lakes, forecasting water levels. So, uh, you know, you got a real good overview of uh, expected basin conditions. So I'll translate that into what we know now about water levels. All right, um, just again, you know, I, this is the third of a series of webinars, so I won't do a whole lot of Great Lakes 101, but just, you know, a couple of basics uh, for you all still. Um, so again, you know, we're talking about, you know, the Great Lakes system here, the largest uh, surface freshwater system in the world. Um, and, you know, we're really a series of very large lakes, you know, connected through a series of what we call connecting channels as you work your way through the system. So. You know, starting up at the north, Lake Superior, uh, water works its way down into Lakes Michigan and Huron, which, you know, again, this is old news for many of you, but, you know, we talk a lot about Lakes Michigan and Huron as one uh, because of the connection to the Straits of Mackinac. They rise and fall together. Uh, you then have, uh, as you work your way down south through Lake Huron, uh, uh, you know, you get into the St. Clair Detroit River corridor as water uh, leaves Lake Huron into Lake Erie. Uh, water then flows from Lake Erie over uh, the Niagara Falls down the Niagara River into Lake Ontario, uh, which then water will escape the system down the St. Lawrence River. Um, I've highlighted the two areas uh, in the Great Lakes system where we do control the outflow from one lake to the other. Uh, but again, you know, I, and I can answer more of the questions and answer period, but again, you know, we have very limited influence uh, on the water levels, you know, through those outflow connections compared to mother nature. So really, really we're dealing with a very natural system uh, that with water levels rising and falling uh, based on our uh, basing conditions that mother nature brings us. All right, so what I have here uh, is the long-term hydrographs for each of the lakes. So uh, what you're looking at are plots of the monthly mean water levels for each lake. Uh, 
uh, over the entire period of records, which goes back to 1918, uh, along with the uh, long-term average level uh, plotted as the red line there. Uh, so I like to show this to keep a few things, I guess, in context and point out here. Uh, first, you notice all the kind of squiggly ups and downs. Uh, what you're seeing there are each of the seasonal patterns that the lakes go through every year with water levels typically rising through the spring and summer, uh, hitting a peak kind of late summer, early fall, uh, with water levels then typically declining uh, through the winter. So you're seeing that seasonal pattern uh, bearing out there with those little ups and downs. Uh, the other thing to notice is you see we go through periods of high water and periods of low water. You know, you can, you know, if you're looking at Lakes Michigan here on especially, you know, you can see some very obvious, uh, you know, obvious low water periods, some obvious high water periods. Uh, but at this point, you know, you can see there's really no clear pattern of how long we spend in, you know, low water periods or high water periods. Some are longer than others. Some are, you know, greater in magnitude. Uh, but again, we, we historically have switched between these periods of high water, periods of low water. Uh, and you can see that you know, where we are now, you're looking at the far right of each of these uh, hydrographs. Uh, we're at 2020, you can see all of the lakes have been well above average uh, and, you know, water levels have been very high over the last few years. Uh, the thing to keep, uh, you know, to kind of use these uh, hydrographs to keep in context also, though, is that uh, you notice as we uh, have been at or above record high levels uh, here recently, you can look back and see that, you know, the previous years where we've had those, you know, previous record highs, are roughly the same in magnitude. So we really haven't been uh, much outside of the range of levels that we've experienced over our recorded history here. All right, uh, I won't be able to get into all of the data and drivers, but you know, long story short for why water levels have been so high is it's just, it's been so wet, you know. We've started to see a little bit of relief this year with uh, not, you know, experiencing some of the record-breaking uh, wet conditions that we have over the last few years. Um, but again, long story short, the water levels that we've been experiencing are driven by uh, just natural conditions, and it's just been very wet. So what does that mean moving forward? So let me walk you through uh, our, our forecast for each of the Great Lakes. Uh, it will give you a good recorded uh, information here over the last couple of years, along with our forecast. Uh, unfortunately, we're putting out our, our newest forecast. I think it will be released um, midweek this week. So this one's a little outdated, but I think they'll generally show similar information. So uh, to orient you to this forecast, uh, what you're looking at here, if you look at the red line, you're looking at the recorded uh, monthly mean water levels here over the last uh, two years. Um, so you can see what the recorded levels have been. Uh, that red line eventually transitions into, you see a, a kind of a shaded band uh, with a green dashed line in it. Uh, and so that's the forecast uh, moving forward with the green being our most probable level uh, and the shaded area being our 90% confidence band. Uh, you see the blue dashed line plotted on the, on the graph uh, and that's the long-term average level. Uh, and then you see the bars at the bottom and top with years on it. Uh, and those are the record high and record low levels. Um, so, you know, the things to point out here when you're looking at Lake Superior, uh, 2019 was really uh, the wet year for Lake Superior. We have a box around uh, all the record high uh, monthly mean levels that were set in 2019 for Lake Superior. Uh, I started off 2020 also fairly wet. You can see we set uh, new records in January and February. Uh, but then we did, you know, we did see conditions dry a bit uh, for us on Lake Superior in the spring and then throughout the summer. So while the levels remained relatively high, uh, they were below the record low levels we experienced in 2019. Uh, and then you can see the forecast moving forward, uh, again, with conditions being a little bit drier at times, um, you know, even under wet conditions, we don't expect to set any further record highs over the next six months. Uh, and we would expect Lake Superior to continue its seasonal decline uh, that it's already started here uh, through the rest of the winter. A little different story uh, 
with Michigan Huron over the last year. So 2019, uh, we didn't quite set any records, but uh, heading into the end of 2019 and 2020, uh, conditions remained fairly wet uh, in the Michigan Huron Basin, which you can see where uh, the water levels that would normally drop quite a bit from a seasonal peak, you know, to its seasonal decline in the winter, levels really held flat through the fall and winter. So that set the stage, you know, for a pretty high start uh, to 2020 uh, that resulted in uh, new monthly mean records being set for each of the months in 2020, uh, all the way through August uh, before water levels finally fell back below uh, below the record highs in September. And then that has continued here into October. So, um, and again, as, as Jeff showed, we are starting to get some pockets of the basin uh, that have had drying conditions, which has been a little bit of a, a relief for the water levels. Um, but you can see that there have been portions of the basin that have stayed wet. So we water levels have stayed, you know, very high despite some areas of the basin being a little drier. Um, and again, our forecast moving forward, uh, we're certainly not out of the woods yet here. Under under wet conditions, we could return to record highs uh, to start 2021. Uh, and under drier conditions on the bottom side of that band, you can see, still see we expect to be well uh, above average uh, for quite some time here. Uh, lake St. Clair follows a very similar pattern to Lakes Michigan and Huron, you know, being a small lake uh, just downstream. So you see similar patterns with record highs in 2019 and 2020. Um, you know, so following kind of a similar story to Michigan here on uh, the confidence band grows a little bit as you get out in St. Clair, just because the lake can respond, you know, it's a smaller lake, it'll respond very quickly to large, uh, you know, large rain events and wet conditions. But uh, otherwise, same same general story. The Geary, uh, similar, you know, again, the records set in 2019 and 2020. Um, the one thing we are starting to see here on Erie, and you'll see again in Ontario, is that eastern half of the Great Lakes Basin has been drying out a bit more than the upper lakes. So we have seen water levels drop uh, below, uh, below the previous record highs set in 2019. Although you can see we're not much beneath those yet. Uh, but the forecast, you know, we still expect Erie to uh, continue dropping along a seasonal decline and, you know, stay, stay a little bit below uh, any other record highs barring uh, extreme wet conditions, you know, later in the, the February, March timeframe. Uh, the thing with Lake Erie is obviously with levels being high in Michigan Huron, that's going to contribute to, you know, high inflow working its way into Lake Erie. So even as the basin has been drying uh, with a large amount of inflow coming to Erie, you know, that still keeps the levels uh, fairly elevated. Lake Ontario coming off the record highs in 2019, uh, much different story here in 2020. Um, again, a couple of factors, you know, one just having drier conditions has helped. Uh, but also, you know, Lake Ontario is more heavily influenced by its outflow regulation, and uh, um, it's very, very sensitive to conditions downstream the, uh, on the St. Lawrence. So that uh, region has very wet conditions, and outflows can't be increased out of Lake Ontario. Um, you know, you'd see higher water levels on Ontario, but but they, you know, they've they've had not just the dry conditions on the Ontario Basin, but also dry conditions downstream. Um, so that's really allowed water levels to come down closer to average uh, on Lake Ontario. You can see again how wide the air band gets looking out into February and March. And that's again because it's we that far out, we really just don't know how what conditions will be on the uh, you know downstream of Lake Ontario and Lake Ontario. So again, we'll, it's still too early to really know you know what we could be experiencing uh, next spring uh, on Lake Ontario because you know, it's going to be highly dependent on what kind of winter and then especially what kind of spring develops. All right, the final slide I wanted to talk a little bit more about uh, La Nina conditions. So you got a little bit of an overview of what that could mean uh, for the Great Lakes region. So um, so we put together a, an outlook uh, to help uh, better, you know, better understand what that could mean for water levels. So. Unfortunately, like anything else that we deal with with water levels, there's still just a high amount of uncertainty, uh, and not 
not a lot of great clear answers for what a La Nina year would mean for Great Lakes water levels, uh, but I'll try and walk you through this information here. So uh, what you see for each of the Great Lakes besides Ontario, which we have not been able to develop into this product yet, um, but for the other four lakes here, you see, uh, you know, the observed water level uh, is the black line. So, you know, similar setup to our other products. Um, but then you start to see these shaded areas uh, starting in October there, uh, looking out over the next 12 months. So what's going on here is we've taken essentially the last 100 years of water supplies and said, okay, if we take current starting water levels and then we route you know, each of these years, uh, you know, through our through our models to see what the resulting water levels would be. If we had those same supplies that we had in those historical years. Um, that gray shaded area represents the range of that all those outcomes would have been within. So it gives you an idea of you take historical water supplies with today's conditions, just feed it through. This is the range of expected water levels that would develop. So obviously you know, very wide range since we've had very dry years in the past, very wet years in the past. Um, so it gives you kind of a range of expected outcomes based on uh, our historical record. Uh, but then what we did is we went back and just took out those years that had, uh, that were moderate to strong La Nina years uh, and only fed those years in and said, okay, well, in previous La Nina years, what, what would water levels have been? Um, and that's then that pink shaded cone, you know, so, so you can see it's, you know, a narrower band than the historical range, uh, but we've had La Nina years that have pushed water levels still very high. We've had La Nina years that have kept water levels, you know, on the lower side. So not a great signal uh, for what you could expect, you know, you're not seeing them shaded strongly, you know, to the upper end of that range or the lower end. Um, I guess a couple things I would point out, though, we also plotted uh, the last two strong La Nina years with 2005 to 2006 and then 2010 to 2011 uh, with those are the green line and the blue line. Um, and, you know, I guess both those last two years, at least on the upper lakes, you can see uh, this, the winter fall region started off on the fairly dry side um, of that band. Um, you know, Lake Superior has a little bit of a blip because it was wet in the fall of 2005-2006, um, but otherwise it dropped pretty quick after that. Um, so I guess we'll see, you know, again, more of the La Nina influence will be felt potentially later in the winter into the early spring. Um, but you can see that those actually, those two years ended up more on the drier side uh, for the upper lakes uh, than they were on the wetter side. Um, when you look down to Erie, you can see actually it was looks like the last two stayed on the wetter side of that band, you know, especially the 2010, 2011, you know, with, had a very wet spring. So, uh, which again, that is a little bit more closer to the Ohio Valley, you know, maybe getting a little bit more of a wetter storm track. Um, so we'll see if that develops that we do see, you know, a little bit wetter conditions again on the Erie, Ontario basin, uh, maybe not quite so much on the upper lakes, but. But yeah, a lot of unknown, uh, you know, that far out, but uh, hopefully this product helps to give a little bit better idea of uh, possible outcomes in, in, in La Nina years. And with that, I think I just have a couple slides of contact information and products, you know, that uh, you guys can all uh, look through afterwards and I think that's it for me. All right. Thanks, John. Um, we're going to transition over here, Brandon. All right. Can you see my screen, Doug? We can, Brandon. Thank you very much. Um, yep. Now it's full screen. Very nice. Uh, Brandon Crumweedy also works, uh, does work for NOAA Office of Coastal Management. He is going to. Uh, as he says, great uh, talk about Great Lakes water levels and coastal impacts. Thank you, Brandon, and take it away. All right, thanks, Doug. So we've had two great presentations um, by Jeff and John, you know, talking about some of the forcings and, and the results that it has in regards to water levels and changes there. And I'm gonna bring it more connected to the coast um, and what we're seeing in terms of changes uh, with these recent periods of high water levels over time. 
and then provide some of the resources that are available uh, to folks as well. So working in the office for coastal management, um, you know, it does present, it's, it's a coastal challenge, um, as we say. And so, you know, naturally shore, shorelines are very much dynamic um, because of their interface with the water, because of the land, and of course the atmosphere as well. And so one of the things that we try to, to manage within the office through coastal management is that understanding of, you know, first and foremost, uh, protection and safety of residents along the coastal areas. Um, being a part, NOAA being a part of the Department of Commerce, we also want to have healthy economies because that's what helps to sustain, you know, local infrastructure and, and becoming resilient uh, to these changes over time. And then also to the natural resources that are provided, you know, in terms of the ecosystem, as well as the benefits they provide back to the populations that live along the Great Lakes. And so, you know, the way we kind of look at it is there's the complexity associated with water levels and understanding what do those changes uh, to Great Lakes water levels mean to our coastal communities. And obviously there's the physical impacts we see, such as erosion um, and coastal flooding. But then there's also the economic and social impacts associated with these changes in water levels as well. So I know everybody's been presented with a bunch of graphs and why not add a few more. Um, you know, one of the biggest challenges is getting a better sense of what do these changes in water levels mean for each of the lakes. Um, and so for each of the lakes, we've got these graphics created. And just to highlight, you know, how much water level change we're dealing with. Uh, if you look at record lows, um, that have occurred in the Great Lakes here in Lake Superior. Um, that was back in April 1926. But more recently, we hit the maximum water level back in October of 1985 and came really close in October 2019 to getting to that um, monthly water level average of 183.91, which was the record, and again, 183.88 meters in October 2019. When you look at these changes, from the record lows to the record highs and the amount of difference, that's what's pretty staggering is how do you accommodate this much change? And so of all the lakes, Lake Superior changes um, probably the least in terms of overall change from low to, to maximum water levels of only 3.9 feet. But if we look at some of our other lakes like Michigan Huron, that can be up to 6.33 feet or Take, for example, Lake St. Clair, like John just pointed out, it's a small water body. And so changes in precipitation or incoming uh, water can dramatically alter the water levels here. And you can have up to 7.08 feet of water level to change. And again, 6.43 in Lake Erie and 7.12 feet in Lake Ontario. And so as coastal communities are trying to become resilient to these changes in water levels, it's, you know, how do we build to accommodate these changes? And let me back up just briefly here. Um, the other thing to take into consideration is how quickly things change as well. Looking here at Lake Michigan, uh, for example, you'll notice that going back and in, in the record low set in 2013 to the water levels we've recently experienced, it's quite a large jump when compared to anything we've seen in the past. And I think that's what we have to take into account is just how quickly water levels now can change in the Great Lakes um, Basin. And so that is something else that, you know, when we think about hopefully water levels going back down over the next several months as John um, and uh, Jeff have presented, you know, now is the time to start assessing uh, what's happening out there and trying to figure out where to uh, fix things, uh, I guess you could say, uh, with regards to the water level impacts. And so when we think about the physical impacts, obviously, you know, coastal flooding when water levels were on the rise and again, we're associated with these coastal storms that have been impacting the system. Um, you know, that's the first thing that a lot of people take photos of. It's something that visually they can see. Um, it poses a risk to property as well as to lives as well. We look at the shoreline erosion and deposition that's occurring, just how quickly our systems have changed over even the last 10 years or so. And then, of course, as that sediment's moving around, what impacts that has, whether that's impact to the ecosystem or, again, you know, filling in our harbors uh, with sediments, you know, there's a cost associated with removing those sediments and moving them elsewhere. We're seeing alterations to the stream and river mouths um, with recent high water levels, for example, here in Lake Superior, 
If you go to some of the small uh, stream, stream tributaries along the North Shore, you'll notice that a lot of these smaller streams are blocked by mounds of large uh, cobble and boulders and, and pebbles and so forth. Um, that these smaller streams began because of what Jeff was showing, you know, we, we had lower precipitation, those river mouths are now completely cut off. So that means there's a lack of hydrological connection um, for fisheries, and especially this time of year when, when fish are running. We're also seeing, you know, the loss to some of our coastal, uh, um, terrestrial, and wetland habitats as well. Loss of piping plover habitat um, or erosion into some of our wetland areas and the drowning out of aquatic vegetation as well with the high water levels. And then two, uh, you know, we're just talking about as water levels are on the rise or on the decrease, but when you compound this with, you know, recent storm events that move through the area, that adds those additional layers of water on top of what already is existing in the lakes and creates a more localized uh, impact as well. So looking at the Great Lakes as a whole and, and kind of the composition of our shorelines, um, this is the uh, summarized statistics from the 2019 Great Lakes Hard and Shorelines classification data set. And you can see that, you know, just over one fifth of the Great Lakes is artificial or hardened. Um, so there's some type of man-made structure there. And so with these high water levels, we've definitely seen an impact to, to some of these, um, either being completely washed out or severely impacted um, and losing their function as a protective uh, boundary. And we can also look at you know, the breakdown to our fine sediment beaches, those are easy to mobilize and I'll discuss these in a little further detail. Um, and then again, the wetlands too, making up almost another one fifth of our Great Lakes uh, shoreline as well. And so as water levels change, it's definitely having an impact to each of these different shoreline types along the Great Lakes. So taking into account and first looking at the artificial or, or hardening of our shorelines, what's interesting here is over one fifth of the Great Lakes shoreline um, and again, I should mention, this is strictly only on the U.S. side um, that we're running these analyses. So I should say over one-fifth of the U.S. Great Lakes shoreline is classified as artificial or hardened um, by coastal infrastructure. And so this can include things like breakwaters, um, jetties, uh, ramp it, uh, ramparts, and, and other uh, structures that have been put in place to either serve as protection, um, or reduce the, the wave runup or wave impacts. Uh, the other thing that's interesting too is the condition of our, our coastal infrastructure in terms of the hardening or, uh, or the artificial uh, shorelines is starting to show its age. Um, when you look at the actual condition of these structures in place, you'll notice that almost close to 70% are either at moderate or poor quality. Uh, that remaining, you know, 30% is in good quality uh, or high quality, meaning it will last anywhere from another 10 to 25 to 50 years. Um, and so this is, you know, one of the things to consider is the economic costs associated with either replacing this or pulling it back out and trying to restore it back to a natural uh, shoreline as well, the costs associated with this along our shores. When we look at the beaches, um, you know, over 16% of the Great Lakes is classified as these fine sediment beaches. So this is your sands or silts or clays, um, you know, with the, obviously the highest concentration being in Lake Michigan. Also, you see high concentrations along the southern shore of Lake Superior, as well as portions of Lake Erie. And the reason I highlight these areas is as these water levels change over time, these are the areas that are highly dynamic and susceptible to changes. Uh, whether that be from water levels, but also the storm events, uh, like the derecho event that um, Jeff presented on. And then again, too, where these materials are mobilized to and from, there may be costs associated with trying to either replace lost sediment or remove sediments that are starting to have a, a pose a threat to safe navigation in the Great Lakes. And then if we look at wetlands, um, again, about one fifth of the Great Lakes shoreline is classed as these coastal and river mouth wetlands. And the reason that we bring this up is as water levels change, you know, they can ultimately uh, have a direct impact on the wetland extent um, in responding to those uh, water level changes. Additionally, this can also have an impact on the biodiversity of our wetlands across the Great Lakes Basin. So as water levels say drop, um, you know, that 
leaves the, the bottomlands exposed or allows for invasive species like Phrygmites to more readily move in and decrease the biodiversity um, or threaten those wetlands. I mentioned, you know, our shorelines have been changing quite a bit. Um, this is an example from Illinois Beach State Park between 2008 and 2018. So again, only 10 years of uh, time difference here. What you can definitely and clearly see is some of the erosion that's occurring. Um, the two spots here highlight that change between 2008 and 2018. And as that material is mobilized or eroded, it starts to transport along the, the littoral or nearshore system. And so you can actually see here um, where red is denoting areas of erosion. Blue is actually increased sediment uh, deposition or mobility of sediments between these two years. And so you can see how quickly our nearshore systems change as well in regards to these changes in water levels. And so it's not just along our shorelines, but actually just you know a few yards or a few hundred yards offshore that we're also seeing the impacts from these changes in water levels over time as well. I mentioned, you know, it's not just the physical, but it's also some of the economic and social impacts that we're seeing, seeing as well. Um, obviously, the damage to the coastal infrastructure, um, whether those are breakwaters uh, or jetties, as I mentioned, being over top, there's a cost associated with either replacing or uh, strengthening or, or re removing too, um, if that is an option. Uh, we're also seeing, you know, flooded marinas and docks, which means that those marinas are no, no longer um, actively taking, say, income in, but now having to spend it back out to protect their infrastructure within those marinas um, as well. We also see hazards to navigation. Um, you know, these beaches and areas, as they start to erode, there may be large weight debris that's deposited into the water. Um, or again, as some of that sediment is moving through, it can both of those, you know, provide or be um, hazards to navigation as well. We've also seen with the high water levels, uh, shrinking of beaches for recreational use, but also uh, the shrinking of those beaches for, uh, as I mentioned, you know, coastal habitat for things like piping plover. And then again, you know, where it really hurts is when you start to see people losing private property. You know, we've seen houses um, falling off of bluffs or being surrounded by water. Um, John's intro slide has, you know, a, a place there in Lake St. Clair where not only do you see the waves breaking over top of the, the structure that's supposed to protect the water to keep the water out, but it's, the streets themselves also being flooded. And so there's a cost associated with, you know, protecting property, um, but then also doing the cleanup afterwards as well. And then lastly, you know, it's not just economic um, and physical impacts, but you also start to hear about the social impacts as well. The, the threat or the thought of sitting in your home at night along the bluff and wondering if this might be the storm that takes your house um, down to the lake. Um, you know, there's that, that distress that's caused by these environmental changes as well. Um, and that's something too that isn't always captured in, in all of the reports, but it is something that has a direct impact to our coastal communities as well. So Digital Coast um, is another part of the Office for Coastal Management where we make a lot of data tools, um, training and resources available to the coastal communities here in the Great Lakes um, that can help to get a better understanding of how these things are impacting along our shorelines. And so we definitely encourage folks to check it out or reach out to us as well to get you connected to what you're looking for. One of those obviously is the, the Lake Level Viewer, which is a tool specifically designed for the Great Lakes region. Uh, this was created back in 2014, uh, based off of the need that we heard from citizens and coastal community members saying that, you know, we don't have data or, or information on what the future looks like in the Great Lakes here in terms of water level changes. Or, what we do have available just doesn't, it's inadequate or I don't feel comfortable working with it as well. And so that was part of the reason for the creation of that tool, but more importantly, the data behind it that allows people to do further in-depth analysis at their local level um, as well, not just at the regional level. And so we highly encourage folks, you know, to work with the tool. It's a great intro point to visualizing what water level changes look like um, along the Great Lakes shoreline. Lastly, um, you know, we have this support network as well. We work very closely with each of the eight Great Lakes states coastal zone management programs. Um, you know, we're providing technical support and guidance to each of them, and they're in turn letting us know what's, hap uh, what's happening on the ground. And so they are the ones 
responsible for the implementation of the Coastal Zone Management Program, and we help to support that implementation here within NOAA. And so with that, just want to say thank you, um, and I'll take any questions. Thanks, Doug. Thank you very much, Brandon. Um, shifting over to Gary. Okay, can you see the screen, Doug? Huh, um, I must be doing something wrong. Okay, wait a minute. Yes, and Gary is our meteorologist in charge at the Cleveland National Weather Service office. So go ahead and take it away, Gary, thank you. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, the uh, National Weather Service offices, and there are multiple ones across the lakes, um, I'll show momentarily. Um, our primary mission is to put out watches, warnings, and advisories uh, when we get weather events that are going to push water around the lakes and, and of course, cause impacts uh, flooding to, to various locations. So um, moving on here to my first slide, uh, these are the primary tools in our arsenal uh, when it comes to uh, coastal flood alerts around the lakes. Uh, we have three what we call products that we issue. Uh, the lakeshore flood warning being the most serious of the three products. Uh, when we issue a lakeshore flood warning, that means that significant coastal flooding is either already occurring or is imminent. Uh, the lakeshore flood watch and lakeshore flood advisory uh, are also alerts we issue, but potentially the situation tends to be more of a minor variety uh, when there is a watch or an advisory out. Uh, a watch, however, can indicate that a, a more severe event is coming. It's just not necessarily imminent. It may be a few days away. I do want to make a note that lakeshore flood advisories are, are generally issued on the western lakes, but not necessarily all of the eastern lakes but the lakeshore flood warning is issued across the board. This is an example of what a lakeshore flood warning would look like. Um, this one happened to be issued by the National Weather Service Office out of Buffalo, New York back in April. Uh, just a few areas that I wanna highlight uh, when we issue a warning. Uh, the first part, you can see the top where the yellow box is is the headline that the lakeshore flood warning, which means that the flooding is either occurring or is imminent, is in effect from noon until eight o'clock Tuesday. There are several other informations below in the bullet, including where this one happened to be for Niagara, Erie, and Chautauqua counties. But there's also an area in the middle here highlighted uh, showing the impacts. And the impacts from this particular event uh, are the rapid rise in water levels, you know, uh, Long Lake here for the upper Niagara River. And you can see we're expecting flooding along Route 5 in Hamburg, and you can go down, you could see other uh, flood prone areas that the impacts talk about. Uh, this is one of the areas that uh, as National Weather Service, we're trying to really get a handle on uh, with these record levels over the last few years are what are the impacts when we get these these storm events, you know, where is the water going to go in certain counties? Uh, what are the impacts going to be to roads and businesses so that we can try to get the message out prior to these events so people can protect life and property. So we're getting a better handle on it. Uh, we still got a ways to go, uh, but at least here in Cleveland, I know we've been doing a lot of work on the Western Basin of Lake Erie. Other types of uh, information we will send out when we're issuing uh, a watch or warning. Uh, this happens to be a graphic issued by the National Weather Service Office here in Cleveland. Um, a lot of these type of graphics will go out on social media, Facebook, Twitter. Uh, you will see them on web pages. Uh, it's a little easier to digest this information when it's in a graphical format versus the text format you saw earlier. Uh, most of the same information that you saw from the warning product will be in here, but in a graphical format. You can see the graphic uh, shows the watch area highlighted for the counties in parts of Northeast Ohio. And then there's a very small sliver there in Northwest Pennsylvania, uh, going from Connecticut, Ohio up to Ripley, New York, showing where the Lakeshore flood warning is. Uh, we also try to uh, place impacts, and, and you can see there in the lower left of, of what to expect. So just a little bit different way of showing um, the Lakeshore flood watch and warning information. 
Um, other offices will issue uh, graphics uh, in a slightly different format, but but almost all offices will issue some type of graphical products when we have a uh, an ongoing event on the uh, on the lakes. This one happens to be out of Buffalo. You can see this one contains a few more graphics uh, over a couple pages. Uh, in the one uh, bottom left here, you can see summary of impacts. So in this graphic, uh, they're trying to show the extent uh, of, of the impacts and whether they're going to be uh, limited or extreme. And you can see from the lakeshore flooding here in the lower left, this was an extreme event. Uh, so it gives you a handle where this stacks up against, you know, uh, impact wise of, of other events. And this one happened to be very high on the scale. Uh, the warning summary here in the lower right, you can see lake levels are expected to exceed 10 feet at Buffalo. So this was a pretty extreme event. Um, and um, as I mentioned earlier, we really like to emphasize what the impacts are going to be and try to get these out in these warning products. Uh, to give you a better handle of, of uh, what, what it's going to do in your area. Now, as I've talked about, and as you can imagine, uh, each weather event is different. Um, and uh, each weather event, depending on the magnitude, can have a significant impact on uh, the coastal flood event, which is going to occur. With the lake levels being uh, near record highs, um, it doesn't take much of a weather event to cause some impact. As we move into the fall season, we've already started what we consider the storm season here on the Great Lakes. Uh, these storm systems that we get, particularly here in November and into December, can be very significant uh, and, and push a lot of water around the lakes, which in turn is going to create uh, coastal flood uh, situations. This is just an example showing just how dramatic some of the impacts can be from a single weather event. I'm using Lake Erie here as an example. Uh, due to the shallow nature of Lake Erie, uh, we do see some large fluctuations on the lake uh, due to storms. In this event here, uh, this was back this spring, the upper left is showing you the uh, forecast wind speeds on Lake Erie. And the numbers here and, and the colors are showing you we're expecting wind speeds particularly on the eastern side to be well over 30 knots. And with that, uh, on the upper right, you can see the color-coded graphics here. We were expecting wave heights anywhere from 10 to 12, maybe even 12 to 15 feet on the eastern edge of Lake Erie. Well, as you can imagine, uh, this is, causes quite a bit water displacement on the lake. And the graph on the lower left shows the forecast displacement uh, the red line that you see on the graph is the displacement uh, forecast to occur at Buffalo, which was a displacement almost of six feet. The opposite occurs on, on uh, Toledo on the western basin, uh, where water is taken out of, the, out of that part of the lake, and you can see we had a drop of almost six feet. Uh, the image here on the lower right shows kind of an overview of what that displacement would look like with the purples and blues showing the water level dropping and the oranges and reds on the eastern end showing the water level rising. So what's interesting about weather, the weather events is that the wind speeds, uh, the wave heights all have impacts uh, with the amount of coastal flooding. The wind direction is also very critical. Uh, a, a small change in wind direction can, can change the amount of water uh, going into certain areas along the shore. Uh, we have bays, uh, we have different coastline orientations. So um, as, as you can imagine, the amount of flooding in a particular location is very dependent on several factors of weather, uh, mainly wind speeds, directions, and wave height. Uh, the National Weather Service out of Detroit is, is actually uh, doing some experimental products. Uh, on, on their webpage, and this webpage you happen to see here, and there's a web link at the top, is for Port Huron. Um, but they're trying to produce probabilities of, of uh, certain occurrences of wind speeds and waves uh, to help people along the lake uh, determine uh, what their, their threat may be. You know, maybe 30, 40 knots, you notice you really have problems when the wind's out of the north, or maybe you get waves uh, you know, in the four to six 
uh, foot range, which, which also cause you problems along your shoreline. So they're producing probability graphics. Now, and I want to show you the two graphics on the bottom here, which are really interesting. Um, the one here on the lower left is a probability of reaching a certain wind speed. And the graphic here on the lower right is the probability of, of reaching a certain wave height. So in, your, in this example, you can clearly see uh, when the, the, the weather event is going to have its greatest impacts. And here, this was April 13th, and you can see by the probabilities and all the different colors that the afternoon, basically from noon to uh, maybe midnight or shortly after midnight, was the, the peak period uh, where we expected a lot of waves, uh, I mean wind and, and waves. The probability graphic, uh, as you can see here, during the peak of the storm, which was somewhere between 3 to 6 p.m. that day, the yellows reached a very high probability of, of getting uh, 80, 90 percent, and those were wind speeds that were over 30, 33 knots. So that was your highest probability of wind, and in most likely scenarios, you're going to get winds that strong. To a lesser extent, uh, there were probabilities of of reaching 40 and 50 knot winds, but they were they were very small, less than 20 percent. But once again, at least as a a customer, you would understand the probability of cer reaching certain wind speeds. Similar situation with the wave heights here in the lower right. Uh, once again, during that that afternoon period of of April 13th, uh, you could see around 4 to 7 p.m. is probably when we were going to get the greatest wave heights. Uh, and this darker gray appeared to be the highest probabilities, uh, which were around four feet. But there was also a 40% chance of, of waves getting in the six foot range. So these are some pretty interesting graphics, probability graphics that the Detroit office is working with. Uh, it's likely these will start to expand to other weather offices uh, across the Great Lakes region. Challenges that our weather offices are having, uh, we'd like to issue these warnings, we, we, we have to issue these warnings, watches, advisories uh, based on impacts. Uh, with the base water levels uh, being near uh, record levels and, and near what our criteria is, um, it's really changed uh, you know, the impact situation. Uh, there's some mit mitigation going on around the lakes, so uh, events probably that happened years ago may not have the same impact that they do in this this day and age because of the mitigation efforts of the high uh, water levels. So we're working with local law enforcement, uh, emergency management, different communities to try to determine what we should be issuing uh, the warnings, watches, advisories that based on the water levels. So for example, uh, you know, in this one, uh, we work with Toledo, 72 inches seems to be where they really have a lot of impacts. Uh, so we're adjusting our warning to 72 inches. Uh, we may be issued watches at 60 inches, but if the base water levels are consistently at 60 inches, um, you know, we may have to work with them to, to adjust that criteria. So a lot of the, the offices across the Great Lakes region are, are working with local partners and, and we're developing these impact criteria. These are the different offices across the Great Lakes region. Uh, you can see there are multiple offices on, on each lake. So depending on where you're at, uh, which lake, uh, you'll be able to be contacting your local forecast office there uh, to uh, get information regarding their warning products, their graphical products, and the different types of services that they issue uh, for their section of their lake. For weather information, um, you can easily go to weather.gov uh, and, and click on the map, uh, whatever area you're in, and it will drill you down to your local weather office. Uh, there's also a weather page called weather.gov slash great lakes which is sort of a one-stop shopping for all weather type information around the Great Lakes e region. So these are both great uh, resources for you uh, to get started to get weather information in your area. And Doug, that's, uh, that's all I have. Thank you, Gary. Very nice 
So thank all of you for your presentations. I also want to uh, add on that uh, both Jennifer Day and Lauren Fry are on to help answer questions as well. So um, some of the questions we've we've uh, tried to get to already. Um, one of the things I'll just say off the top is this was a, uh, if you will, a U.S. effort for, and, and that's why uh, maybe some of the Canadian issues weren't uh, addressed, but a lot of this also was across the board, and across the border really, in terms of information, in terms of impact. So um, there are, are particular issues, of course, in Canada that are different than U.S., but that's that would be a different, uh, different subject and a different call. <clears throat> so um, again, all the slides will be posted, uh, and so will the recording. We'll send out information on that. Oh, in the near future, once it's posted, so you know where to go to get it. Uh, and I'll go down the list of questions. Again, some of these have been some some of these have been answered, and some of them haven't. Um, some of the folks that uh, talked, you can look in the questions section and anticipate some of the questions that are going to be coming towards you in just a moment. So one of the questions was, is there a relationship between the derecho event, the big high wind event that went across Iowa all the way to Chicago and the southern Great Lakes, southern Lake Michigan, really? Uh, is there a relationship between that big wind event in August and uh, climate change? And Jeff, do you want to say anything about that uh, further? Because there is another question about, and it, it, I guess I'm just sort of getting people ready for the next question. Um, <laughs> there is another question about what climate change means to lake levels generally in the future. And I think uh, the person is pointing towards very a greater variability. But before we answer that, derecho and climate change. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And, and then I, I jotted in a, a quick, and it's always, always quicker to just to say a couple sentences, but in short answer, no. It's 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 almost impossible to to attribute a, an event, but basically a cluster of, of thunderstorms together on that on those uh, limited spatial and temporal scales. It, it, it's almost impossible to look and, and and somehow link that with a larger continental or global change uh, in, in climate that's going on in the background. But but that said, it's also important to note that. Uh, given the projections of the future, uh, which are are all warmer uh, and and uh, and at least in the short term, uh, somewhat wetter as well for the Great Lakes region, and those those also match observed changes in the area. But given those those projected changes, there's also a possibility that we would see uh, thunderstorms become potentially more uh, severe, or at least the intensity of thunderstorms could increase in the future. So. The, they're not they're not completely independent and there there is some thought that at least that events like this while we can't attribute them to, to some larger change they're they're at least consistent with what is projected to happen in the future and i think that's probably as far as we can go with uh, and you can say the same thing about individual blizzards or or other uh, singular weather short term events the same as well and and what happens when we get these large long term changes in the in the background we basically we change the probabilities of those, both the frequency of those events and sometimes the intensity of the events, like the thunderstorms, and and that's that's a it's a much more complicated thing to do. But that's in a well, in a little bit of a nutshell, that's that's sort of the response to that. Uh, it, it's it's a difficult thing. Yep, and Jeff, the only thing I'd add to that is sometimes, if you will, and this is not every time, the effect of climate change may add one or two percent. <laughs> to the intensity and 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 so how are you going to measure the fact that we had whatever it was 125 mile an hour winds versus 126 mile an hour winds because of climate change that's how subtle the changes can be now let me go back um to the other question that we had in terms of water levels and uh the comment really was about how uh the, the canadian uh uh, climate folks have been looking have been looking at uh, looking at and studying water levels, and some of their modeling is showing that there will be greater variability between now and 2100, and probably well beyond that. Uh, in 
so does anybody want to comment on that? That's the sort of an open floor thing, Jeff. I don't know if you're the most the best to answer that or anybody else. Oh well, and I I, I probably will pass to to Lauren, but there is there definitely is work, and and this is a well Lauren's organization at, at, uh, at, and Glarell, Brent Lofgren, Drew Grunwald, and, and others have certainly looked at this issue. It's it's complicated, and at least to my knowledge, for the some of the research that's been done, uh, it, on our side, or at least with NOAA, that the uh, the overall direction of the outcome was was mixed. So minor changes, minor increases in lake levels, some minor decreases. Uh, in the future, and it, but it's it's evolving, and uh, the the models are certainly getting better uh, and more descriptive. But it's it's a it's a difficult thing to do, and and the uh, the climate simulation models that are used for this, uh, it, it's it's asking them to do a difficult thing. Uh, Lauren, I, I I'll I'll <laughs> turn it over to you. To, you you probably have additional comments or thoughts on that. Um, sure. I think I think you really said it pretty well, though, Jeff. Um, it is it's complicated and the influence of changes in temperature and precipitation can have different impacts on the on the water supply that's actually getting into the lakes and so um it's different from how we might picture climate change impacting the ocean coasts where water levels go up um with melting ice here we have to think about impacts on lake thermodynamics um and how precipitation is translated to runoff and so, yeah, there is a lot of variability in, in how those changes are projected to impact lake levels. And so I think that what, what the question included was some um, wording of variability. And that is something that we, we need to be prepared for is um, both high and low water levels and potentially changes in how we, how we go from high to low or low to high water levels. Doug, this is Brandon. Just yeah, to, add, to add to that, <clears throat> I think the other thing there, as Laura mentioned, there's the, the changes to precipitation and temperature, but then we also have to think about the, the surface hydrological routing and how the basin is physically changing as well. Um, you know, increased anthropogenic changes the land cover, um, you know, built out of the in, urban environments, um, which means ex expediting, you know, water contribution through stormwater. Um, routing especially just given the scale of the water its surface itself compared to the area um, but the other thing i'll mention too is when you look at observational data for water levels uh, compared to you know thinking about the temporal scale of changes we really only have a small slice of what that looks like um, to work with to, to help with the modeling efforts Um, moving on, uh, so regarding the high water levels, uh, there is a notion that evaporation levels are going to be higher this winter than normal, I suppose you could say, over the entire basin. Is that what, uh, in this case, NOAA's data is showing? Does anybody want to um, anybody want to guess at that one? Is there any reason to think evaporation levels should be higher for any reason this coming winter? Um, this is Laura. I'll, I'll try to answer that and see if others want to chime in too. Um, so I, I haven't seen the the model projections for evaporation. John might might have uh, that in mind. Um, not sure based on his forecasters runs of of. Um, the lake thermodynamic model, but uh, evaporation is really driven by differences in difference between the air temperature and the surface water temperature. So if we if we see warm surface water temperatures and then we see you know, cooler air coming into the region, um, that could be an indication that we would have higher evaporation rates, especially in the early part of the winter. Um, so that it's really this difference between the surface water temperature and the air temperature that we'll see that will be driving the evaporation rates. Okay. And yeah, Lauren, at well, this point, I don't think we have a clear indication of, oh, yes, we're for sure going to see things get much colder and drive early evaporation, you know, so I think at this point, we just don't have a clear expectation one way or the other of high or low evaporation this winter. Uh, 
Uh, this one's for Brandon. Uh, what is being classified as shoreline? Are you only looking at the shore, or are you including shoreline of islands? So yeah, we're including the islands as well. Um, when the the recent data set that we created, Doug, is uh, actually extrapolated out of 2014 to 2017 aerial imagery and LIDAR data. And so we take into account anything that's lakeward facing. Uh, so that does include islands, but it does not necessarily include, for example, estuaries. Um, when we created that data set, we were working with Army Corps and it was really to assess the assets, really the coastal assets that, that are actually being faced to the, the brute force of the lakes um, as well. So we do include all of the islands uh, with that as well. Um, this is sort of an open question for anybody who thinks they can answer it. <clears throat> uh, can we assume that due to the increases in inflows into the lakes, um, resulting in the higher levels, uh, that inflow uh, has potentially increased nutrient and pollution levels in the lake? Are there any studies ongoing to measure what these effects might be from polluted inflows? Or is it diluted out? Any anybody can anybody tackle that on this call? Or give a educated guess. So Doug, I guess one of the things that I will say there are people looking into it um, a little bit more. For example, there's been a lot of interest in Lake Superior with the development of algae blooms in the near shore along Wisconsin and and the uh, western arm of Lake Superior there. Um, you know, what's really interesting too is with the influence of the lakes rising, as I mentioned, you know, the sediment itself is blocked, but that also means that any contaminants coming downstream are either concentrated more at the mouths or in that littoral zone um, in terms of interaction. But you're right, with higher water levels, you know, that's increased water volume, which means potentially the ability to dilute it much quicker. Um, but there's an interface between the inflows coming in versus what the lake is, and there's that back and forth um, with where those concentrations may be. Uh, again, I think further research is still needed to, to really validate, and there are, like I said, folks working on that. Okay, thank you. Um, one of this, oh, another question is, uh, do, do the higher lake levels affect navigation to the extent that lower levels have on navigation? especially for the larger lake boats. Yeah, so this is Brandon. We definitely, when we had Brandon. the period of lower water levels, we saw the impacts there where, you know, the freighters definitely were not able to carry as much cargo because, you know, for the risk of running aground. Um, as I mentioned, you know, during the periods of high water levels, it's just things floating around. They get to be a, you know, if you see a tree floating out there in a small recreational boat, it's going to have a big impact. Um, but yeah, definitely with during periods of low water levels, and again, you know, we keep thinking about the high water levels recently, but it was only, you know, a decade ago or so, we were dealing with record low water levels, that that too also posed a, uh, a risk to safe navigation as well. Yeah. And I um, guess okay. that on the upper lakes, it's less of an issue, but um, I guess as you get down the, you know, down the St. Lawrence River, St. Lawrence Seaway, um, you have the higher, higher water levels could translate to then the higher flows, which can be a problem uh, for navigation, at least in that, that stretch of the area. So I think it's less of an issue when we have the high levels, high flows in the upper lakes, but it can pose a problem to navigation uh, down uh, on the St. Lawrence. Uh the question is posed, how is snow melt in the upper watershed being considered in projections for lake, lake levels? I, I, I'm sure it is. I, I, just any quick answer there? Yeah, yeah, so certainly once we get into the winter and we start accumulating the snowpack, um, you know, some of our models do take that into account as far as the amount of water that we have available to melt off. So that is captured in our, our forecasting procedures. Um, I think it was Brandon. Can you talk a little bit more about how wind affects drowned river mouth system 
fishery habitat and if there are any significant differences related to prevailing winds, uh, for example, along Lake Michigan Western, uh, or Lake Michigan in West Michigan versus Lake Huron um, on the eastern side of Michigan. Okay, I'm just trying to get geographies here, Doug, as you're reading that. So, <laughs> yeah, it's what I should mention too is it's really specific to the physical setting as well in terms of whether or not you have coarse versus fine sediments at the end of those river miles. Um, like I mentioned in, in Lake Superior here, where we have you know some of the coarser beach sediments, uh, what happens is the, the lake itself has the energy and the momentum, you know, again, due to littoral uh, current to actually cause those coarse sediments to fill up in those river mouths. And so with the decreased uh, surface precipitation, which means, you know, less stream flow, it can't clear those river mouths out. And so that's where you end up with these temporary uh, dams of cobble that prevent fish from moving upstream. Uh, in, as I mentioned, you know, in Lake Michigan, you have more of the fine sediments. And so that may be the key case where they're being mobilized and it may be much more temporary in terms of the blockage to fish passage. Um, and again, we're specifically talking at the river mouths themselves. And we're seeing, you know, things shifting around quite a bit there um, in that regard. In Lake Huron, um, I'd have to go in and, and look and see. I've primarily been looking at Michigan and, and Superior, but um, it really is depending upon what the, you know, the sediment flows coming in from the stream are, as well as the sediment at or near the river mouse that can, you know, potentially lead to that blockage, aquatic uh, connectivity blockage. Okay, uh, quick question for uh, Gary. How accurate are lightning strike maps? Can you record those accurately? Maybe the maybe major lightning strikes and duration of events over time as a proxy for intensity. Yeah, definitely that is the case, but go ahead, Gary. Anything you want to say about lightning strike maps? Um, I mean, lightning strike maps are, are an approximation of, uh, you know, the uh, lightning activity, the, the amount of flashes and their location. Uh, they're a good approximation. Um, it's not an exact science, um, but uh, a, a really good estimation. Yeah. How significant and what are the projections for ice cover on Lake Michigan? Is that to me as well? Um, uh, anybody? I mean, <laughs> we, do, we do do, uh, you know, we do do ice forecasting out of the National Weather Service in Cleveland for all the Great Lakes. Um, we'll be issuing our first uh, freeze up outlook here probably within the next couple of weeks. So we'll be looking at a lot of different things. Um, uh, so I, I don't have a good estimate. We're a little early in the season to be predicting the amount of ice. Uh, but as we get towards the end of November and early December, uh, we'll have a little better handle on it. And and Gary, is that something you work with Glarel on as well, uh, the Great Lakes Environmental Research Lab? Because I know that yeah, we, we do. Um, Glarel yeah. does has some ice forecasting models that we use to assist us. We also work with the U.S. National Ice Center uh, pretty closely. Um, we issue ice outlooks normally. Um, at the end of December, we issue them about three days a week um, to to update the you know on the formation and deterioration of ice across all the Great Lakes. Uh, you know, so a normal year uh, for ice formation where we start that is is towards the end of December. Um, an early year would be the beginning of December. The latest I think we've ever started is early January. But like I said, it's just it's a little bit early yet. Uh, to get an indication on the ice trends, um, but that should be coming, um, you know, by the end of this month. Okay, thank you. How much volume or percent does the storm wa the storm water generally contribute to the rising water levels, or contribute to uh, water levels? Period. Uh, John, you might be best, or Lauren. Um. I can actually have almost, let's see if I've got the uh, graphic of this here. Um, yeah, so I guess, you know, it, it, it varies lake by lake, you know, depending on which part of the system you're in, as far as then what percent, you know, runoff plays uh, in a typical year. Um, yeah, uh, 
sorry, I don't have the exact percentages of uh, what they are per lake. Um, you know, maybe about, oh, there you go, I've got it. That is a, yeah, so when you're looking at the upper lakes, um, you know, maybe uh, roughly 30 to 40% in a typical year of its, you know, water coming into that specific lake uh, is coming from runoff. Uh, when you get down to the lower lakes, though, they're much more heavily influenced by the flow coming into them from the upstream lakes. Uh, and there, the runoff is going to be more on the order of 10 to 15 percent of its overall kind of water budget coming in. Okay, good. Okay, um, we're going to run out of time here, but we only have a few more questions. I'm going to try and fight through them here. Uh, so, are we making lake level predictions for the recreation seasons? Uh, it says for 21 and 22. Let's start with 21. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, no. So, you know, as far out as we forecast is just, you know, six months, like I showed earlier, you know, you yeah. see how wide the uncertainty bands get at that point. So uh, by January, you know, we'll start to have a better feel for at least the, that part of the recreation season will be more included in our forecast. Okay. And, and then uh, someone also we have an no idea. <laughs> And then uh, another question on ice cover this winter, and that'll be coming out uh, imminently by the end of the, by the end of the month for sure. Um, okay, uh, I, I think we've answered this, but I'll, I'll, I'll ask one more time. Can can you say that high water levels right now are explicitly due to climate change, or is it more of a drastic change in lake levels that is due to or drastic? changes uh, due to climate change, or are both these statements too strong? <sighs> Jeff or anybody else? I think we've covered this, but let's do it again. Yeah, I'll, st I'll just start uh, with the reflection. Uh, our, car our climate is uh, somewhere on the order of 10 to 15 percent wetter now on average than it was just 40 years ago. And that, that to me is a, is a, is a climate change. And, uh, and I, th I think a lot of what's happening with certainly what the Great Lakes are in response to just all that additional water in the landscape. So I, I, I have to, at least some of it, you'd have to say yes, that is a, it is a discernible and a real change in climate. It's just that it's looking in the rearview mirror at it. That, that would be at least my initial response to that. Mm -hmm. And again, it's not necessarily the, the specific year or season that is, uh, that climate change is affecting. It is more of a longer term a pattern, so we have to think about it that way. Uh, there is another question about community communities beginning to plan out for the next 25 to 50 years. Can NOAA or the Corps help with facilitate discussions, and if so, how? And I'll, I'll just say there's a multitude of different groups. Uh, Jeff, you're part of one from a Galisa point of view that does this sort of for a living, I guess you could say, but there's also Digital Coast uh, website that uh, and Brant, I don't know who wants to talk about this. I mean, we could go on that. We could have a separate call just on these issues. Uh, what can what can communities do? And it's something to actually think about. Thanks for the question. Um, for the next 25 to 50 years, anybody want to say any more about that uh, quickly? So, Doug, this is Brandon. I just added in a couple links to the chat. Um, there's actually a wealth of facilitation training resources available through the Digital Coast, as you mentioned, uh, through the training uh, link. Um, and the, lat the latest link I just sent is actually specifically called out all the facilitation. We actually do have facilitators that can help pull those meetings together. Um, and again, there, and as you pointed out, Doug, there are a wealth of meetings that are happening right now to, to look at this. Um, I know the Coastal States Organization just wrapped up, you know, their nearshore uh, ecosystem assessment workshops to look at, you know, what the future looks like in terms of water level changes as it relates to coastal ecosystems. Um, I know that there's, you know, folks looking at things like regional sediment management, um, as well as coastal communities uh, through the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Cities Initiative. So there is definitely a, a wealth of events, it seems like. Like they say, it takes a disaster to organize a community. Um, and unfortunately, I think the high water levels is, has been that disaster as of late. Um, but definitely, it's getting on everybody's radar, it seems like. So I'll leave it at that. OK, thank you. One last comment, I think more or uh, less, uh, and if, if, uh, back to you, Brandon, in terms of uh, including islands in the shoreline, 
uh, there's the comment that the Georgian Bay has has a total coastline of 10,000 kilometers, 19,000 wetlands on the islands, the shoreline, and connected waterways near the shore. I suggest that, therefore, uh, the percent of Great Lakes shoreline that is wetland may be higher than previously stated. Not sure. So again, the one the one caveat I'll add there, Doug, is those numbers are reflective of only the U.S. side. It does not include yep. all of the islands uh, associated on the Canadian side of Lake Huron. Great. Okay. And on that note, I think we're going to call it a day. I think this was quite successful. I hope I, I, we got some good uh, feedback here. Lots of great questions as usual. Um, we will consider doing this again if and when conditions uh, tell us to, if you will, or uh, you guys ask us to out there. So thank you all who uh, hung in here for quite a while and listening to all of our comments. Uh, thanks to all the presenters and Jennifer, Day, and Lauren for your help here. And I'm going to conclude this and have a great day, everybody.